So I've randomly downloaded Slime Rancher once when it was on Games Pass, with no idea what to expect, and ended up losing hours. Entire evenings vanished into slime management and plot logistics. It was really addictive. But somewhere between the carrot farming and the slime chaos, I realised something. This game was actually teaching me ecology. Not passively, actively, system by system, mistake by mistake. So today we're unpacking what Slime Rancher teaches us about biology, ecosystems, and the invisible rules that govern life, even on alien worlds. This is Slime Rancher through the lens of a biologist. The Far Far Range, a distant alien world bursting with vibrant colours and bouncing blobs. At first glance, it feels more like a toy box than a living system. But beneath the cartoon aesthetic is something far more structured. Slime Rancher may be a game, but it almost functions as a model ecosystem, a simplified interactive representation of how life systems work, and it does so with surprising accuracy. Ecologists describe ecosystems in terms of trophic levels, the flow of energy and nutrients from one type of organism to another. Think of it as a pyramid. Energy starts at the bottom and moves upward, with every level depending on the stability of those below. Primary producers are the foundation. In Slime Rancher, these are fruits and vegetables, pogo fruit, carrots, mint mangoes. They represent autotrophs, organisms that create their own energy. They feed everyone else. Then you've got the primary consumers, which are the first link in the food chain. Herbivorous and omnivorous slimes, pinks, rocks, phosphors, consume plant matter and convert it into usable energy for higher level predators. Even hens, though their diet isn't shown, act as primary consumers. They're prey animals, most likely dependent on vegetation in this simplified model. Then the secondary consumers step in as predators. Tabby slimes and hunter slimes rely on meat, primarily hens, to survive. In ecological terms, these are carnivores. They play a vital role in keeping prey populations in check. And then there are the tars. They don't fit neatly into our food pyramid. They break it, created through excess. When slimes absorb too many plorts from incompatible species, they become aggressive, uncontrollable, and ecologically catastrophic. They consume everything, slimes, chickens, the entire populations. This structure with producers at the bottom, consumers above, and destabilizing forces at the edges is more than just a game mechanic. It really feels like a working model of how energy and risk flow in real ecosystems. In the far, far range, your role isn't just collecting cute creatures, you're effectively managing ecological stability, whether you realize it or not. And the moment the balance is lost, the consequences are immediate. It's simplified, yes, abstracted, but it follows the same rules that govern every living system, from coral reefs to savannas. In Slime Rancher, equilibrium is everything, and once it's gone, it's very hard to get it back. In ecological systems, disruption doesn't always come from outside. Often, it emerges from within, the result of imbalance, pressure, or unchecked growth. And in Slime Rancher, this disruption has a name. Tar. Tar slimes aren't part of the natural order. They don't follow the food web or trophic logic. They're a product of excess, formed when slimes consume too many incompatible plots and mutate beyond their ecological limits. What emerges is not just another predator, it's a runaway organism, hostile, indiscriminate and self-replicating, a biological failure state. We've seen this before, not in alien ecosystems, but in our own. Cane toads in Australia were introduced to control pests and ended up poisoning the native predators. Zebra mussels spread through ballast water clogged waterways and overwhelmed native mussel populations. European rabbits were introduced to other areas for hunting and devastated vegetation and soil systems. Even fungal pathogens like chytrid fungus in amphibians have spread faster than nature can contain. These species share key traits, rapid reproduction, few or no predators, and an ability to outcompete or wipe out native species. They don't just live, they dominate, and in doing so, they just mantle the systems around them. The tar behaves in the same way. It doesn't feed selectively, it devours everything. Slimes, hens, entire ranches. Where it spreads, biodiversity drops to zero. It's not predation, it's obliteration. In ecological terms, this is what's called a trophic collapse, when the interdependent structure of an ecosystem breaks down and species can no longer maintain their roles. Food chains fragment, populations crash, and the most revealing part, 
The tar isn't a random event. It doesn't come from the environment. It comes from the player's choices, feeding too much, mixing too freely, prioritizing output over equilibrium. Like all real world invasive crises, the root of collapse isn't just the invader, it's the imbalance that allowed it to thrive. And in that, Slime Rancher offers one of the most powerful ecological metaphors in gaming. It's easy to dismiss slimes as pure fantasy, elastic bobs of colour happily bouncing across alien terrain, but when you strip away the cartoon layers and examine their traits through a biological lens, the question becomes more compelling. Could something like a slime actually exist? Raw biology has already produced some remarkable and remarkably slime-like organisms. They may not blink with googly eyes or explode when startled, but their traits overlap in surprising ways. Slime molds, for instance, are single-celled organisms that defy expectations. They can move, search for food, solve mazes and optimise for efficiency, all without a brain. In their foraging behaviour, they exhibit decision-making that borders on intelligence. Tenophores and jellyfish are gelatinous marine animals some use bioluminescence, others are voracious predators despite their delicate appearance. They're soft-bodied, alien-looking and adapted to environments that offer little in the way of stability. Amphibians provide another clue. Some species can absorb nutrients and toxins through their skin, secrete protective mucus and even change colour to blend with their surroundings. If nature can produce a shape-shifting, nutrient-absorbing, semi-mobile blob with behavioural responses and a unique biochemistry, then the leap to a basic slime becomes smaller than it seems. No, a real slime likely wouldn't bounce, it wouldn't smile, and it certainly wouldn't fire glittery crystals from its body every time it ate a carrot. But a gelatinous, responsive organism, one that thrives in damp conditions, responds to stimuli, and even engages in basic decision-making, as Earth biology just reframed. In many ways, slimes are a vessel for imagining alien life with ends of our own, a biologically plausible creature exaggerated for play, but rooted in real systems of mobility, survival, and adaptation. Up until now, we've looked at what slimes are, but to understand them as organisms, even hypothetical ones, we need to examine not just their structure, but their behaviour. Within Slime Rancher, different species exhibit distinct, often specialised actions, behaviours that hunt at adaption, memory, even decision-making. Hunter slimes can turn invisible and stalk their prey, ambushing with precision. This is more than instinct, it's a complex hunting strategy built on stealth, patience and spatial awareness. Phosphor slimes flee from sunlight, in what seems to be biological version. In nature, many organisms exhibit photophobic behavior for protection, temporary regulation, or to avoid desiccation. Some slimes cluster, others avoid one another. Some pursue food, others flee when provoked. They resemble ethological patterns seen in animals with nervous systems. Then there's the question of reproduction. Slimes don't mate, they don't lay eggs. Instead, they mutate when exposed to foreign plots, entering entirely new forms. This isn't reproduction in the classical sense, it's closer to horizontal gene transfer, a process where genetic material is observed from another organism and integrated directly. We see this in bacteria, some plants, even animals that absorb DNA from prey or parasites. And yet in the game, these fusions aren't always stable. You mix the wrong plots and you don't get evolution. You get ecological failure and the emergence of tar. If we really want to treat slime ranches as an ecological system, we could even consider questioning its ethics. Because if slimes do have preferences, behaviours, reactions, and if they do respond to stimuli with more than reflex, then we must ask, are we farming sentient beings? They're confined, force-fed and harvested, and their waste, plots, becomes the foundation of the economy. They generate value, but have no choice. In Earth's history, we've struggled with this line before, the distinction between tool and being, between resource and individual. From livestock to AI, we continually question what deserves autonomy and what doesn't. In Slime Rancher, this ethical ambiguity is never resolved, but it lingers. Because whether by design or by accident, the game invites us to ask, what do we owe the creatures we profit from, even in fiction? For all its whimsy and colour, Slime Rancher delivers something rare, a subtle, intuitive lesson in ecological literacy. Because if you look past the slimes and plorts and pogo fruit, you'll find an ecosystem in miniature, one that mirrors the pressures, patterns and breakdowns we see across rural environments on Earth. Slime populations like those in nature can't grow unchecked. Too much of one species disrupts the system, the food runs out, the predators suffer, the entire chain trembles. No matter how efficient your ranch is, the environment can only support so many mouths. Beyond that, through overfeeding or careless breeding, and you invite collapse. Slimes like hunters or sabers aren't chaotic threats, they're stabilizers. 
In natural systems, apex predators prevent overpopulation, protect diversity, and shape entire ecosystems, just like wolves in Yellowstone or sharks in coral reefs. The more types of slimes you raise, the more sources of food you plant, the better your ranch holds together. This reflects a core ecological truth. Biodiversity cushions systems against change. When the ecosystem unravels, when the tars appear and food sources disappear, and production outpaces care, Slime Launcher doesn't punish you arbitrarily. It follows the logic of real life. Games like Slime Launcher provide a safe space to experiment with systems we rarely get to influence in reality. They invite curiosity and reward observation. And they gently remind us that every action has an impact, even in a world made of goo. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, consider supporting me on buymeacoffee.com. See you next time.